All right, well, welcome everybody to Solar Noon Tuesday. And as per normal, what we'll do, well, I should introduce myself first. I'm Jay Warmke, uh, and, and I'm with uh, solarpvtraining.com. And this week, actually, we're, we're beginning a, a relationship with the American Solar Energy Society. So that's kind of interesting that um, we'll be... Um, working together on this and they'll be promoting it and I'll be saying things that they'll be upset with, no doubt. And uh, that's the way these things work. I guess they'll they'll be sending me nasty emails periodically and I'll, I'll say, okay, sorry. So anyway, so uh, this is uh, the news for the week of February 18th. And um, there's a group of um, manufacturers, automobile manufacturers who have received permission this week to, um, begin operating a nationwide or a North American wide um, charging station um, network. These are level three or the fast chargers. The, the automobile manufacturers who are involved are BMW, General Motors, Honda, Hyundai, um, Kia, Mercedes-Benz, and Stellantis. I'd never heard of Stellantis, but they own Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Alfa Romeo, uh, Peugeot, uh, along with some other brands. And they will be operating this jointly. Their plan is to deploy about 30,000 DC fast chargers. Those are the level three fast chargers. Um, and they will be accessible to those folks who have EVs that use the NACS or the North American charging standard ports, the plugs that go into the into the vehicle. And that's essentially the Tesla um, model. And then they'll also will work with CCS, which is that stands for combined charging system. And that's pretty much everybody else. So essentially all of the North American EVs, these things will be compatible with both. But all of the major manufacturers of, the, of autos have announced that their EVs are transitioning to the NACS. So everybody's standardizing on the Tesla um, plugs. And that's really because Tesla has about 60% more charging stations out there than all of the others combined. So um, so they won the battle and everybody's going to, this is sort of a, a VHS Betamax kind of thing. I'm probably aging myself, but um, uh, anyway, that's uh, we're going to be moving to that particular standard. Uh, there are a number of states that are are targeting um, renewable energy. Uh, some are moving forward. A couple of them are moving backwards here as far as uh, the advancing renewables. Community solar is expanding in the state of Georgia. There's Senate Bill 210 and House Bill 1152, which is looking to allow private investors to build community solar systems up to six megawatts in size. So these are relatively small systems. Uh, up until now, the only community solar that was allowed, or primarily, was owned by utilities. It was the uh, Georgia Power Community Solar Program, and then there was the uh, Electric Cooperative of Georgia Community Solar Program. So basically, these are utility-owned projects that then allow their customers to purchase into the projects to uh, obtain uh, renewable energy rather than using fossil fuel. But to my way of thinking, that's really not what community solar is all about. Um, community solar is a way of competing with Maybe the uh, utility. So um, that's uh, that's where we're that's where we're at there in the state of Georgia. Just muted there. All right, in, the, in Virginia, um, the Virginia legislation has tabled plans to open up uh, utility competition in the region served by Dominion Energy and Appalachian Power in those regions. Um, negotiations broke down because during the negotiation, there were plans as part of this bill to increase the amount of renewables required by the utilities from 1% to 5%. And Dominion said they were already having trouble reaching the 1% target. And by taking it to 5%, that would be onerous. So the whole thing kind of fell apart. Um, this comes at a time when a lot of developers of solar in Virginia are complaining that Dominion Energy is putting rules and regulations in place um, that prevent them from interconnecting to the grid. 
Um, they, they say that these rules and regulations magically disappear if it's a project that's owned by Dominion. But if it's an outside project, then Dominion will not give these folks um, the ability to connect into the system. So we'll see how that plays out. And in Arizona, this is another one of the one step backwards kind of things. The Arizona Corporation Commission uh, began the process of eliminating a lot of rules around uh, energy efficiency, um, the low demand reduction, as well as renewable energy um, set aside standards. Uh, these were set in 2010. The commission ruled that uh, these um, these rules should go uh, should be eliminated, and it was a straight party vote. There are five commissioners. The four Republicans said, let's eliminate the rules. The one Democrat said, let's keep these rules in place. Now, uh, the, the target set in Arizona is 15% uh, coming from renewables. And it's interesting because EIA um, said that in uh, the Energy Industries Agency, I think it is, um, anyway, the governmental body for energy, um, they said in 2022, Arizona had already exceeded the um, 15%, that they were actually getting 16% from renewables, 10% from solar, 5% from hydro, 1% from wind. So, I mean, to be fair to the commissioners, they may have said, well, these rules are no longer required because we've already exceeded them. That may be the issue. And Tampa-based aerospace company Meridian Aerospace is testing perovskite panels in space in low Earth orbit um, the perovskite offers lower cost, higher efficiencies than the current go-to for outer space applications, which is a thin film panel called, uh, that uses gallium uh, arsenide. And uh, NASA has been testing perovskite panels on the um, solar um, space station. And they found that not only are they very efficient, but they're very robust in that environment. And they did find, surprisingly, that there is a certain amount of self-healing that takes place with these solar panels in that environment, which makes them ide ideal for space. So we may see perovskite um, getting into the applications for space-based solar. And that's the news from the solar industry for this week. Did anybody have anything um, additional that popped up on there? Radar in the world of solar. I'll give you just a second to jump in if you're so inclined. Hey, Jay. It's yeah. Don. Yeah, Don. I was going to say, I don't know if you've seen it. I saw something, um, I forget where I read it or saw it the other day, about the uh, two faced panels, which were uh, being placed vertically. And uh -huh. there were some studies that were being done saying they were doing better than equally sized panels um, that were at an angle. And it had to do, they thought, they, the person who did it wasn't sure did, that they thought because of the heat, uh, uh, the amount of heat that the vert that the inclined panels got versus the vertical panels. I don't know if you've seen any studies, any of that, or? I, I saw the article, I think maybe you're mentioning, and it was kind okay. of interesting. They had just built it into a fence. Um, and, and I could see that because, of course, if you've got a vertical panel, it's not going to be absorbing the same amount of heat. And you're going to get reflected off the surface. I would imagine in a sandy environment or a uh, snow-covered environment, it's going to work even better. So mm -hmm. I could see there's a lot of applications for those bifacial panels in a in a fencing kind of situation. My only concern might be that um, you know they're not all that they're kind of fragile, you know. And and if you're getting things kicked up against a fence. Um, somebody with a weed whip <laughs> could do some serious damage. So you, if you raise them up off the ground enough to keep them keep them safe, I, I imagine. I think they were saying they were looking at these for commercial. As they made them easier to maintain because you could drive up and down as far oh, as yeah. uh, uh, mowing the lawn or, or you know, have that cattle, but I guess sheep or something, you know, goats, who knows? <laughs> goats, goats would make short order of them. I know we've had to raise ours like six feet off the ground. All right, uh, Cameron, I see your hand is raised. You've got something to add there? Yeah, for the um, the vertical uh, dual-sided ones, what I've read is that they aren't more efficient. It's that they get the um, higher demand hours, so in the mornings and in the evenings, so that they require less storage um, than actual uh, south-facing panels. And also the 
uh, the the way that they're um, stood up, they don't uh, acquire as much heat, so they don't need as much cooling. Um, so they retain a lot higher efficiency, but they don't actually generate more electricity over a 24 hour period or even a 365 hour period. They just might reduce the demand for actual battery storage in the future. Okay. And I could see in the agrivoltaic situations, of course, having them vertical gives you more land space to grow crops. Uh, you know, there'd be less shade. I assume you would orient these things east, east and west rather than north and south, you know, so that it tracks during the, the day. That would be my assumption. And somebody in chat had raised an issue about is the perovskite stuff going to trickle down to uh, to land-based applications? Um, and you know, hopefully, right now, land-based were or terra-based, we're seeing um, perovskite as part of these tandem panels where you, where you get a silicon panel and then put a layer of perovskite onto it um, to uh, in, increase the efficiency. So I think we'll see that first commercially available. And then we may see a full transition over to perovskite at some point as that technology develops, because you know it's a cheaper mechanism or cheaper to produce, less energy intensive, and uh, the efficiencies are getting up there to be comparable with silicon, certainly. Okay, let me jump into some of the announcements. And if people have some uh, some other things or other questions, they can pop on in. Um, so the announcements for this week, there's uh, webinars coming up on uh, the 20th at 11. That's today. Oh, 11.30, already gone. Too bad you missed it. Cost reductions um, uh, for uh, solar companies. I'm sure they'll record it. A little bit later today, uh, there's veterans recruiting and retention through CEA. And um, clean energy apprenticeship programs. This is one put on by IREC. It's at 2 p.m. on the 22nd. Uh, then at, on the 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern time, all of these are Eastern times, um, there's Wood McKenzie is putting on one about the economics of carbon capture and storage. If you're into that, and on March 12th, uh, CEA is going to be putting on a uh, the IRA and apprenticeship programs, uh, how that affects it. That's a big deal when you get into the larger utility scale programs or projects. March 13th at 1130 is utility scale so, uh, storage projects. And then the NABCEP conference is coming up uh, March 18th through the 21st in Raleigh, North Carolina. So you can put that on your schedule. March 21st, uh, data in utility scale uh, solar systems. Uh, that's a webinar put on by Solar Power World. And then, of course, our shameless ad on uh, solarpvtraining.com. We've got our online courses and some face-to-face -face courses that you can get there. And I did want to draw particular attention. We've got a class starting March 5th uh, that's going to be held at uh, Eastern West Virginia uh, Community and Technical College. So um, if, if you want to check that one out, we've also got a couple in Southeastern Ohio as well. And those are the announcements I had. I'll throw it open here to see if anybody had anything um, that came across their desk as far as an event coming up, we can throw out there. Give you just a second. Then um, I thought what we would talk about today in the um, topic, the deep dive topic here uh, on Solar Noon Tuesday is, is really the evolution uh, of Enphase product line. Uh, Enphase being the dominant residential system that's out there uh, here in North America, uh, the microinverters that they uh, offer. And, and there's not only an evolution in the product line, but also there's compatibility issues that crop up. So as these products are announced, they're oftentimes not backwards compatible. And uh, you can find that very frustrating and it, and it gets very confusing as well. So I just thought I would uh, focus in a little bit on that, talk, uh, talk to it a bit. Oh, uh, I got a solar um, thing right here in my face. All right, well, uh, I can't fix that on the fly. Anyway, on uh, 2006 is when the Enphase company uh, was founded. And um, it was founded by two guys in California. And by 2007, they had released the um, 
the M175. That was the very first really commercially available microinverter. And then by 2009, it, they had introduced the uh, M190. Now these had inputs of 230 watts. So at that time, that was a pretty pretty large panel with outputs of 190 watts. Let's hope that logo goes away. Yes, it went away, good. All right, so um, then in 2011, the M215, and, and I guess in, in my um, experience, this is the first microinverter I, I was dealing with. Um, and it had input ranges now, instead of a fixed input, uh, it was saying that 190 watts to 270 watts. And, and I recall at that time, 270 was a really big solar panel and it had output of 215 watts. Then in 2000, now there was a problem with this particular microinverter and, and some people who were doing installations at the time were a little bit um, you know, put off by it because there were some uh, reliability issues. They tended to fail um, you know, relatively often. And a lot of the solar installers uh, sort of got turned off from them and moved over to Solar Edge as, a, as an option. Um, these are warrantied, they'd replace them still required you go out and, and actually swap them out. So that was a bit annoying. Then in 2013, they introduced the 250. Uh, here, this has an operating... Uh, here, this has an operating... Oop, I'm getting a little bit of feedback there. All right, um, this has an operating range of about... Uh, it's all the way up to 300 watt panels. This will produce uh, 240 watts continually. So at this point, they sort of transitioned their um, their uh, output numbers. Instead of saying this is the continuous output, they started like using the number based on maximum output, uh, probably just marketing there. The 250s proved to be pretty uh, reliable, pretty robust. Um, I should have mentioned by 2010, Enphase had gone from pretty much a startup to uh, to uh, locking in about 13% of the residential market by 2010. Um, as we move forward, you'll see that Enphase's um, market share gets larger and larger and larger. Um, so the 250s, pretty robust. Uh, these are all of these inverters operated at 20, 208, three phase, 240, single phase. Uh, the input range uh, on this, the output is 240, 240 watts, uh, but takes up to 300 watt panels. Then in 215, uh, 2015, sorry, um, they introduced um, uh, one called the S230. They also had an S280. Now, this is weird because when I was researching it, this is part of their um, rollout, but I never ran across these. Uh, it must have been just a California kind of thing, because uh, really the only change that I could see in this particular item was it it conformed with the new California Rule 21, which was the the smart inverter um, rules um, there. That was sort of their jump into that, because California said we need these inverters to have certain capabilities, and the M250s didn't have those. So um, this, this was probably just something that was fairly locally available because then very shortly in 2017, they introduced the IQ line. Um, so they jumped from the M's, um, the M215, the M250. Uh, they came into the, uh, the IQ6 and the IQ6 plus. Now, I put a little red line in above there because at this point, these things are no longer backwardly compatible. Um, they required new wiring. It was a whole different wiring system, different disconnect tools. Uh, they eliminated uh, the old M, M series had four wires there as part of the uh, uh, the trunk cable that was that came with these things. They had the two two hots, uh, neutral and a ground, an equipment grounding wire in there. Uh, then when you jump to the IQ series, they really only went with the two hots. There was no uh, re return neutral and there was no ground. All of the, the grounding is done in the case of the unit. So it's equipment grounded to the railing and it's all part of that. So a little bit easier to wire. You know, you're only dealing with two wires instead of four. 
Um, some of the trunk cable a little bit cheaper, some of the connectors a little bit cheaper, but they're no longer backwardly compatible. You just can't use the same uh, wiring system. Now the IQ6s, um, those things had a uh, range 235 through 400 watts. And the output is now bumped up to about 290 watts there um, is your AC output. And then uh, the IQ sevens and the seven pluses came the next year. Now all of these are smart inverters, the IQ, I guess, standing for, you know, intelligent quotient, quotient or, or whatever. I, th I guess they thought that was cute. And uh, now the IQ uh, sevens really was not a major leap forward, just a little bit bigger panels, a little bit bigger um, output, 295 versus two, 290 as far as output. But these things now go up to 440 watts. Again, 440 watts, pretty pretty big panel um, for um, residential systems, for sure. And then in 2021, they introduced the IQ8 and the 8 Plus. And once again, these are no longer backwardly compatible. And the reason for this, it wasn't so much a matter of let's use it for bigger panels, which has been one of the reasons for these evolutions in the past. But here now they came up with what they call um, sunlight backup. So uh, when the grid goes down, uh, these microinverters can actually, I think they call it grid forming technology, where if you've got a disconnect switch, if you've got a smart switch or a system controller that disconnects you from the grid, you can then operate off of these microinverters without battery backup uh, as long as the sun is shining. So it's basically sunlight only. Um, so, you know, a lot of folks kind of logically, you say, I've got this solar array. We've got a long-term power outage. Um, I don't have any batteries, but I've still got the solar array. Why can't I just disconnect from the grid and let this thing operate? Well, finally, the IQ8s allow for that, but they're no longer compatible with the IQ7s or the IQ6s or any of the M series. So we get this backward compatibility issue that's going on there. And uh, that brings us kind of to today, where we are today. Um, there's a whole series of these IQ8s. And the IQ8s there, you can see there's the regular eight, which is um, going to be uh, generating about 240 volt amps as opposed to watts. I mean, I mean you, you think about generators, they're, they're measured in terms of volt amps as opposed to watts. Loads are, are measured in, in watts. These can take panels anywhere from 235 to 420 watts. Uh, and the maximum DC voltage is going to be about 50 volts. So that was fine. You get the 8 plus, a little bit bigger output, 290 uh, volt amps output can go with bigger panels up to the 440s, and it can accept 60 volt um, from, from the panels themselves. Again, these operate where they connect only to one panel, one microinverter, one panel. Then if you needed a little bit bigger panel, um, they had the uh, IQ8M. This thing will go all the way up to 460 watts. So these are um, for the larger panels there. Then there was the IQ8A, and the 8A is um, uh, goes up to, um, it produces 350 volt amps. They say 349, that seems pretty exact there. And, and I think it goes up to 60 volts as well. And then you've got the H, which is um, a little bit bigger still. And this will take you all the way up to a 540 watt panel. So this really starts to look at uh, small commercial systems. You can take some of those very large panels that they use in utility scale or commercial systems, and now you can use it with microinverters. Uh, and then there was another issue that arose where some of the panel manufacturers are using higher voltages than 60 volts. And the microinverters simply did not work with those. So they went to, uh, they came out with the IQ8X and that will go up to almost 80 volts internally, 79.5 volts and can take 540 watt panels. And then uh, there's some commercial, uh, these are three phase systems. 
So uh, they're really trying to get out there into the commercial or the utility scale. I can't see utility scale with microinverters, but commercial three phase, um, you know, with these microinverters generating as much as, um, you know, 480 volt amps, pretty big, pretty big system. All right, so that's kind of the evolution of the um, microinverters, um, how they how they popped out there. And I guess the main thing to bear in mind as far as microinverters is once you get to the IQ8s, because they're sunlight backup, they're no longer backwardly compatible. And you're not supposed to be mixing these strings or anything like that, which has led to a bit of a market for the IQ7s if you want to ex expand a, a previous version you know, you got to go out and find IQ7s, you know, to put on that if if that's what you've already got installed. So that becomes a bit problematic, uh, you know, you're entering into the world of eBay uh, at that point. Um, let me let me pause here and see if anybody has any questions on the inverters, because I'm going to try and go through the, the microinverters, then the communication systems, then the combiner boxes and the... Um, and the uh, switches, and then also into some of the battery technologies, because there's some compatibility issues there as well. But I just wanted to uh, give folks a, a chance to jump in. Catherine saying, are solar companies encouraging sunlight backup? Um, so one company and one vendor is discouraging it. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I have it on this system here. Uh, here at our office, um, you know, we haven't had a power outage that I could test it with, but we could, I mean, we did just turn off the main and it's interesting because it just, you know, the, the backed up circuits just popped straight on, you know, you, you didn't see any interruption there. So it's kind of nice if you're just thinking about, I don't want to invest thousands and thousands of dollars in a battery, but I want to make sure that, um, let's say we have a power outage in the winter time. I'd like my gas furnace to, to run, so I need some electricity to run the thermostat and the blower, but it's not a lot of um, power that's required. Uh, and, and I'm giving you examples of what we backed up. Uh, the refrigerator is backed up, the office modem, those kind of things. And, and we could survive an extended power outage um, you know, with, with just those things operating during daylight hours. So, um, you know, that's fine. You know, you heat up the house during the day, let it cool off at night, heat, uh, you know, cool down your refrigerator during the day. It's not going to happen not much at night there. So it's an alternative, but eventually we're probably going to be adding in batteries. Okay. Um, in the world of communications, yeah, Al? Yeah, along that line, I'm just curious because uh, I'm in Ohio and when I installed my system, I installed a battery, and I've been told that uh, unless you have a battery with critical loads panels, uh, you cannot operate uh, any, uh, any, you can't pull any power off the solar panels during a power outage uh, because uh, you can't feed back to the grid. Right. Well, all of those systems, the sunlight backup and the battery is going to require that you have a auto transformer or a disconnect that that senses that the grid is down and physically disconnects you from the grid. That way you avoid feeding back right. to the grid. You know, some of the old generator systems, you know, you've got to somehow disconnect from the grid if you're going to run a generator. And I've seen some that are as basic as there's a little slide bar. And in order to plug in the generator, it turns off your, your main, you know, that that's very manual. Uh, with this system, the auto transformer, or they call it a smart switch, or they call it a system controller, it, it connects to the grid and it senses. And when the grid goes off, it physically disconnects you from the grid. Then if, if power is available from the, bat, uh, from the panels, you know, you can use it because you're in an island mode, you know, you're, you're, you're disconnected. Same thing that would happen if you had batteries. Um, now, one of the interesting things with sunlight backup is you don't have unlimited power. So let's say in our case, we've set up four different loads. Uh, we've got our sump pump, our furnace, the refrigerator, and the office modems. Well, depending on cloud cover, how much sun the things are generating, 
maybe not all of those loads can operate at the same time um, because there's just not enough power to do it. So they've got a little load management thing that you set it up and you give these loads priority. And you say, okay, this load is first priority. If there's enough power, run the second load. If there's enough power, run the third. If there's enough power, run all four. But it sets it up in that hierarchy uh, and turns them on and off. Hopefully, I've never had to test it, but <laughs> hopefully uh, it takes care of it. So does that make sense? Yeah, it's still the, the, the load or the power coming off the panel still has to go through an inverter of some kind. Uh, oh, yeah. And so to also to make sure that it's in phase with all your appliances and whatnot, right? Yeah, well, the microinverters, of course, are connected directly to the panels. So the only power coming off of the panels is AC. It's right. it's 240 AC. Um, and that's another thing you you point out because typically they get their their signal reference from the grid. Um, you know, they're they're setting up their voltages and their their waveform and everything else. Uh, by referencing the grid. So the smart inverter has a big transform or the smart controller has a big transformer in there that actually has to generate a neutral. It can generate the split phase from the 240. So it's a it's a pretty beefy piece of equipment, um, but it, it basically goes into island mode and it does all the things it needs to do magically. So you know, all for, for the low, low price of about 2,500 bucks for that one piece of equipment there. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So as part of these systems, you know, you want to be able to monitor and um, see what your different panels are doing and how they're working. Um, so, so there are these monitoring devices through the years, these things have changed. Um, the one I was familiar with first is the Envoy there in the bottom left-hand corner. That one um, was sort of the first monitor, and you would plug that into an outlet as close to the um, service panel box in your house as possible um, so that no appliances were interfering. And then it read all of the signal from the um, array over the power line. So the data was coming in through the power lines, through your service panel and going into this, and then you connected this unit to your modem. Um, then as uh, they introduced the IQ system, they had to change the unit. So the one right above it is the IQ Envoy. And then as people were dealing with Rex, trying to sell Rex back um, to, to the various um, uh, states that had that uh, portfolio standard, renewable energy portfolio standards, they came up with a metered one that was acceptable. Uh, like, for example, when I had the Envoy and I looked at selling RECs, they said, no, you don't have anything that's measuring to the precision that we require. Um, so, so we can't trust your data. Well, they came out with a metered system. And then eventually they simply incorporated it into the combiner box. Uh, so the combiner box became a feature of, of the um, microinverter system. Uh, originally, you just simply take the microinverter, attach it to your solar panel, you'd run a wire to an AC disconnect, and then you would just connect into your service panel. Dead simple, really easy to do. You're only dealing with AC wiring, um, it was kind of a do-it-yourself homeowner kind of thing, um, you know, if you had the if you had the uh, confidence to do so. But it wasn't that difficult. But when they came up with the combiner box, they decided, all right, we've got this little combiner box here, so um, we're going to stick that little uh, communication device right in the box. And then if you look in here uh, closely, there's just a couple of breakers a communication device, and then right above those breakers is a CT, um, a current transformer. And um, this is um, this is where you would get your measurement. You run line one um, of of all of the branch circuits through that, and uh, it measures the amount of power that's flowing from the um, array. And, and that's where that measurement is taking place. And then it's feeding it into the uh, the gateway there, the communication device, and letting you know um, 
what that what that unit is doing. Then they decided, all right, we needed to change this a little bit. And and from the literature that I read, that was because they were wanting to incorporate batteries at this stage. And so they said, you know, for a wire management system, let's move that CT over to the right so that you can feed your line ones into the two breakers at the top. And then you can run the third uh, line from a battery to the breaker at the bottom and everybody's happy. So this is kind of a two breaker system, third breaker for batteries. That's, that's kind of where they were at there. Um, then they evolved it to the third, to the combiner box three. And the major changes that they did here was they simply got rid of the case for the communication device and they stuck that there just a circuit board as opposed to that box that's inside. They uh, allow you now to put in four uh, 20 uh, amp breakers into the combiner box. So you can have four branch circuits um, that could either be coming from the array or coming from batteries. The CT is down there in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, there's there's some controls up at the top and then there's just a neutral and a, and a um, grounding bus bar down there in the bottom. So relatively simple, relatively straightforward. Um, if if you've installed the system, you're probably familiar with the with the three. Then they came out with the four, um, the the combiner box four. Now there are a couple of things here. Uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure if these communication devices are on the three. I think they might be, but this shows the top cover and that little orange E there with the end phase, the black unit that's that's stuck there is uh, the communication device. And, and the purpose for that, and it's it's required for the system to operate, this thing um, communicates through um, Bluetooth with, this, with the um, auto transformer, the system controller, with any batteries. So all of these systems, the battery bank system, the controller, and your array through this are communicating with each other wirelessly. So you so you have to have that little communication device. Um, actually, Enphase told me the best thing to do is is this is a box that screws into the front. But if you open up that box, all it is is a USB stick, you know, a thumb drive uh, that's got a little cord that goes and plugs in. And they said just take the box, throw it away, take the thumb drive out of it, and just plug it into the USB thing up at the top. That eliminates any concerns you might have with connections. You know, you've just added another connector in there. Then the other thing down at the bottom there, that little silver box, is a um, it's a um, cellular um, unit for cell communications. And so they sell these boxes either as uh, end phase combiner box four or four C. The 4C includes these communication devices. And for whatever reason, Enphase has decided that you cannot really install this system unless you have cellular modem built into it, which is very annoying. It's not required as part of the system to operate, but it is required for you to commission the system. Uh, I was able to get them to bypass it because I didn't have one. But their claim is, well, if the power goes out, you know, your modem may go down and the system's not going to be uh, communicating. So you got to have this cellular modem. But these cell modems add another 350 or 400 bucks to the cost of the system. So um, quite, quite annoying there, um, but it's in, it's required. And these have gotten so complicated now that you just can't commission them unless you've gone through the end phase university training. Um, so it's no longer a homeowner kind of thing. Now it's it's an installer kind of thing. The other thing is the IQ8s have to have uh, the combiner box four. So they will not work with the combiner box three. And then um, we're running into a uh, the switch, the smart switch, which we were just talking about with Al a minute ago. This is the auto transformer here. Uh, it's it's a very big. Uh, the thing at the top is is the trans uh, the transformer there, 
Uh, this is where all the connections, this is the brains of the operation. Uh, you connect in your solar panels there, you connect in your batteries there, you connect over to your uh, to your uh, loads, whether it's your main service panel or backup service panel. And one thing that, that uh, there's a um, controller, the system controller one works with all of the M type microinverters and the IQ six and sevens, but it does not work with the IQ eight. So you've got to have a system controller two if you're dealing with IQ eights. Um, so this is again, another compatibility issue. If you're gonna work with IQ8s, you gotta have the combiner box number four and you've gotta have the system controller number two. So you just better make sure you got those. And you're gonna need to have the combiner box four C because you're gonna need the communication devices there. Um, and then we add in batteries and this adds another level of complexity to it. Um, the battery banks, the way these things work typically is you've got the M power or the system controller there. You're going to hook in batteries. You've got the combiner box there. So this is an older version, probably IQ sevens um, or sixes because it has the combiner box three. And I wanted to show you sort of an exploded version of the uh, batteries. So these batteries that you're seeing here in the middle, this is the N charge threes and tens. So one's 10 kW kilowatt hours and the other one is three kilowatt hours. Well, the 10 is basically three of these threes, you know, just in a single case, that's all that was. So they really just had a three that they hooked up in series. So when you open it up, you've got some microinverters in there so this is taking the power and uh, converting it to AC when it comes out uh, because this is a AC coupled system. Um, so th that's what they call those four IQ8X battery inverters. Um, they're just little microinverters in there. There's, there's controlling boards, there's ban battery management systems in there, there's an on off switch, and then you get the batteries themselves. So, so these units, when you're talking about lithium ion batteries, there's more in there than just batteries. Not like the old lead acid battery where you just had the battery. This is now a whole controlling system. And so that's what's inside those things. Well, they just came out, Enphase just came out with the new uh, Enphase 5 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, sounds great. It's nice. It's a little bit lower price um, for more power, that kind of thing. But the thing that they were getting a lot of complaints about was the fact that these things communicated wirelessly. So they decided, let's just hardwire them together. Well, by deciding that they want to hardwire these things together, now the new uh, 5kW battery, 5 kilowatt hour battery, no longer will work with the combiner box four or with the smart switch three or two, sorry, um, because they all have the Bluetooth capability. So that said, if you're gonna use the new five kilowatt hour battery, you've got to go with the new combiner box and the new smart switch. So if you're not thoroughly confused already, you're not, you haven't been listening closely, but I thought I would just sort of summarize them here in this, in this graphic, where if you're using the IQ sixes or sevens, you can use the load control or the system controller one or two. You can use the three T's or the 10 T batteries. You can't use the five kilowatt hour battery. They drop the key T and I think they call it a P now for some reason. And you can use the combiner boxes threes or fours. May as well buy the four if you're buying it new because it's the same price. Um, yeah, all <laughs> somebody commenting about the complexity. Yeah, I'll come on on that in a second. If we get into the IQ series eights, uh, these are the ones with the sunlight backup. Well, now you got to have the system controller too. You can still use the the 10Ts or the 3Ts and the combiner um, fours. Uh, so, so that's the one that's required. You got to have a four for the combiner box if you're using the IQ8s. You got to have a controller two 
if you're using the IQ8s. But if you decide, I really like the new battery, well, you can still use those with the IQ8s, but you've got to have the new system controller, the three, and the combiner box five or five C. So uh, because these things now all operate wired together, the communication, no longer Bluetooth. So that's a quick summary, quick <laughs> summary of uh, of all of the issues with the end phase. And as, as uh, I think it was Pete who commented that these things are very um, complicated, which is, is true. Um, and uh, it just reminds me a lot. In fact, we had some people over looking at the system here. It reminds me of the early days of local area networks uh, when you were doing uh, the, that kind of uh, hooking up computers to each other with printers and modems. And you pretty much had to have some sort of uh, computer analyst come in, do all of the wiring, do all of the connections. You had to go through a lot of steps to get these things communicating with each other. And today you turn on your laptop and it says, hey, I found a, I found a network. You want to connect? Sure. Hey, I found a printer. You want to connect? Sure. So, so that's kind of where we got to get to. With, with the world of solar because, uh, you know, it's just way too complicated. And I found it very annoying. I mean, the training was good, but having to go through Enphase University and basically go through about 30 hours of training um, in order to commission the system uh, was uh, excessive. I mean, if you do this for a living, sure, you know, that's, that's just the, the cost of doing business. But if you're a homeowner wanting to install your own system, it's no longer just as simple as, you know, take a microinverter, connect it to the panel, run the wires down to an AC disconnect, and then hook into a double pole breaker, and, and away you go. Now, I think, um, if I remember right, Bill, um, you're still doing these kind of systems uh, in Kansas there, and you just simply bypass all of the technology so you don't monitor your system is that right? Uh, Jay, the the complications come in with the monitoring consumption. You know, it, it, most people can can figure out the L one going through the the CT for monitoring the generation. When you get into when you get into monitoring consumption, and that's one thing that the combiner boxes I still don't understand the combiner boxes and how. They monitor consumption. They have to to be able to to judge rate of discharge in the batteries and all kinds of other things. Yeah. So, and there's a and there's a, a distance that is the maximum distance for the leads going from the CTs to the consumption to the to the the connection on the on the combiner box. So, they've got to get around that somehow, and maybe that's where the Bluetooth came in. I yeah, except know. those consumption units, uh, no, they went from Bluetooth to uh, to wired. Um, yeah, the CTs that you're talking about consumption, basically, we're uh, in the combiner box. It's it's measuring quite easily how much the array is producing. Now you're uh -huh. saying, okay, we need to be able to monitor how much the home is consuming. And typically that's done. There's little connection ports there in the uh, combiner box and you get this blue and white wired CT that you run all the way. And you typically are gonna put one over each of the line one and line two coming in from the utility right there at the um, entrance, right before it goes to your main in, yeah. in, in the box. So you're right, you've got, and there are distance limitations. So you've got to locate that combiner box somewhere near your service panel. Well, um, and the second thing, the second thing is also, it's gotta be phase compatible. It's gotta be, it's, you've gotta have the phases right so that it's measuring the right phase coming out of the, out of the utility lines from the service entry cable. And some main breakers switch those things like Siemens switches those, reverses those inside their breakers. So you've got to be able to, you've got to have some electrician who's willing to learn how, you know, how, whether that, that particular breaker, whether that panel has got a compatible breaker or if it switches internally. Um, we, I'm, I'm really content to stick with the IQ7 if I can find them. <laughs> That's true. And do you do you even use a combiner box when you're doing your systems out there, or do you just uh, just go straight uh, just with Typically, one, one string? 
or typically what? not typically not but and we've just gone with the old school method even and i think we're still offering iq8 we're we're offering iq8s because it does at least allow for future battery compatibility mm -hmm. but we but not because you know, when we go through the smart switch, I've we've had people who've been interested in the sunlight backup, but I sh I we're going to have real trouble trying to find electricians who are willing to go through all that trouble without charging, you know, for a, a morning or a day's worth of head scratching. Yeah, I know my experience with it. Every time I've gone to commission an end phase system, I end up having to get on the phone with customer service and you go through a whole process and it usually takes several hours of, of talking to Jacob or talking to Chet. And I mean, they're super helpful. They're nice, nice folks, but, but you just keep going, really, I've got to keep doing this, you know, and, and, and one time it was a matter of some relay switch in the, in the, um, system controller was was tripped in the wrong position and he goes well i'm i'm seeing that it's tripped in the wrong position i said well how do i fix that he goes oh you can't fix that i've got to do it from here i said really what are you, what are you talking about and so we're sitting there on the phone and all of a sudden i could hear the thing go and click you know inside there and he goes yeah okay i reset it and i was like oh this is this is crazy i gotta call idaho in order for me to uh to uh, turn on my system. That's uh, yes. So, oh, and yes. then another thing that just happened, and this is something I'd never read about, but um, I think they had a, um, a software upgrade. And what it did is it reset some of the system controls back to, I guess, their factory settings, even after we had gone through and commissioned everything. And, and the net result of it was all of our critical loads that we had set up for sunlight backup, so they stay on when the grid goes down, they were reset to be off when the grid was on. So, and of course I wasn't here at our office. So what happened is all of a sudden the refrigerator turned off, the furnace turned off, the bottom turned off. Um, everything that I deemed critical was now not functioning. Uh, and that was all just a software glitch that uh, happened during their their software upgrade, which was very problematic because the modem was turned off and that was what I needed to reset the system. So we were running extension cords all over the house and trying to get everything working. And, and that turned out to be about a four hour project. So Jay, one of the, that's real concerning in that we have a customer who just, who just put a system in uh, and he's setting it to zero export. And that's the condition of his approval with his application for the utility is that it, this rural this rural cooperative is not allowing him to export any power back to their line. So he's got to have it on zero export. If they can if they can with that just switch of the software, update it and then void the the grid uh, the grid preferences that we've already set, then it screws him. Yeah. Well, I think we're sort of pointing out that this system is no longer simple uh, and and no longer no longer trouble free. <laughs> so uh, it's still, but the the technologies are are neat, you know, I mean, they're good technologies. Um, but we just need to understand we're still in the floppy disk age of solar here, and we're still figuring this stuff out, but hopefully they won't uh, you know destroy their their market position in in the process. Um, what what can you tell us about the market position at this point? Oh, Are well, they still 70% or 80%? Yeah, end phase, the last number I looked at, it was um, as of 2020, they were 50% of the market, of the U.S. residential market, not just the microinverter market, but the residential market, and 72% um, of the world's microinverter market. So, so they're dominant, dominant, and they've been picking up market share at the expense of uh, Solar Edge, which had its own reliability issues. So, between Solar Edge and Enphase, that represents about ninety percent of the residential market here in the U.S. So, 
All right. Well, we're coming up on a hard stop here on the time. I want to thank everybody for joining us here to Solar Noon Tuesday, and uh, we'll see you guys next week. All right.